This study on personal financial planning and stewardship is conducted by Dennis Henderson. In continuing Study 7's topic, The Christian and Wealth, our guest speaker, Mr. Chuck Missler, focuses on business ethics. This is an interesting hour for me because um, this is probably the first time, to my knowledge, at Calvary Chapel, having taught the Monday night series for almost 10 years and being on the board of directors of Calvary Chapel, the first time I've been before a group at Calvary professionally, because up, most of you around here know me as Chuck Mistler, the Monday night prophecy nut. And uh, um, my, I, ma I make my living as a professional executive. And um, it's going to be kind of interesting because I think part of the remarks I want to make hang heavily on, on giving a little better feeling for what I do in my work environment to put in context some peculiar attitudes that I have about um, business. So uh, uh, just to, so you, get, you can get a... First of all, let me, for those of you that don't know me, I won't go into a long testimony except to say that I am a born-again believer in Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of my life. Um, there are 10,000 tapes in the hands of the firefighters and the lending library and whatever. It'll tell you more than you want to know about my, my spiritual biases and prejudices. But I, and since I'm going to get into some personal things, I want right up front, you are entitled to ask if I didn't give it to you for a testimony and dealing with some of the things I'm going to get into. Um, um, but having said that, let me move on and mention some things that you, most of you that know me well may not know professionally. My background, I was raised here in Southern California. I'm a Naval Academy graduate. have master's degrees in business from UCLA plus some other places. Um, I made my early executive career in the defense industry, um, SDC, TRW. Then I went to the Ford Motor Company for six years. was on private salary roles as a key executive there. Set up their worldwide computer network. Left there, formed a company which is now known as ADP Network Services, which is on... It's a New York Stock Exchange company. And um, from 1970 to the present time, roughly, I have been in mergers and acquisitions and in troubled business turnaround type situations. From uh, Also in that period, from the, in the last 10 years, I've been on probably, I think it's 10 public boards of directors. I was a consultant to the board of Rockwell International and their acquisition some years ago and some other number of companies. Uh, I've served on the board of... Uh, ComServe, Applied Devices, Pertech, eh, anyway, a lot of others, mostly in the computing electronics industry. I'm on the board of the Computer and Communications Industry Association in Washington. And I mention all of this just to put in perspective. I'll come perhaps from a high technology and corporate perspective in some of my attitudes about, about business. Um, it'll be my intention to sort of focus on some issues, get some things off my chest that a professional businessman would be concerned about but taking for granted a biblical perspective rather than the other way around, usually. I have to comment on Dennis's headline here on the blackboard. He's put, uh, all, business, all business fail as a result of poor planning, as sort of a teaser on there. Uh, there's a basic rule in the computing industry that's a little different. And it, I should write up there, careful planning is no substitute for dumb luck. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole idea of uh, planning... Um, and I'm not here to disparage planning. On the, on the other hand, uh, 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 to imply that Western digital success, for example, is a result of planning would be to deny the sovereignty of God. And that's a, a interesting. I hadn't thought about it until I framed the sentence, but I believe it's true. Because um, what's happened in the last few years in that particular business situation is so, pe so peculiar that unbelieving executives... I'll put it that way because they'd be unbelievers in our context, um, have made remarks to their wives and others that since the summer of 77, something supernatural is going on at Western Digital. That what's happened there is so conspicuous from a business point of view that a supernatural hand has been noted by observers. And I'll come back to that, but let me get some other things off my chest first. Um, also in the last 10 years, I have been involved in a lot of deals. I have, I have uh, uh, spent my, a lot of my time as not only as a professional board member, but also in mergers and acquisitions and startups and turnarounds. I was hired by the banks, Chase Manhattan, UCB, others. You excuse my mentioning a competitor there, Dan. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are smaller banks in the world than the world's largest. And uh, 
the uh, I have been guilty of, of trafficking with the riffraff there. I didn't try saw it. Sorry. Uh, Bank of America. Somebody asked me once, gee, Chuck, do you feel you're successful? And I say, I must be. I owe several million dollars. Half a, half a million to, to Dennis here. So I've got to be nice to him. He's my, he's my creditor. Um, got an interesting question came up in the first hour, you know, how can, can you, you know, about owing any man anything. And I, I'll, I'll take that to heart, Dennis. Uh, Dennis was shocked that one of his pupils would act, you know, I do, you can be in debt. Is, is that biblical? Um, one of the things, uh, I got a lot of sort of assorted topics I'd like to get into that are sort of uh, perhaps taboo topics typically in a Christian group because uh, the classical patterns we all like to believe is that, gee, so-and-so just accepted the Lord and then after so-and-so just accepts the Lord and goes to a few you know, Bible studies during the week and starts walking in a Christian walk, first thing you know, his business starts to go to pieces. And all his Christian friends stand around very piously and say, hmm, the Lord is dealing with John. Mm -hmm. And uh, indeed, sometimes the Lord will do just that, to to root a guy out of worldliness. On the other hand, often a person gets fouled up in his business because he's misapplying uh, things that well-meaning Bible students have taught him that really are not necessarily valid for a third-party steward. And I'm going to try and divorce my, sub- my comments here from someone's personal finances. And the concept I'm going to assume is that you are a custodian for other people's resources. And uh, because I think if the other pe- per- person's resources happens to be your wife and family, you won't be far wrong in what you do. If you regard the resources you are managing, call it a business. Whether you're the professional chief executive officer of a public corporation with 5,000 shareholders and what have you, or whether you're the proprietor of a business that will really pass on to your state if you should get hit by a car tonight. Your, your actions that I'm going to f- sort of focus on is a, as a third-party steward, that is a steward for somebody else's property. Not the buyer or the seller, but somebody else, the owner. The owner being public shareholders or being the owner being your wife and family or what have you. And I maintain that most of the Christian, quote, unquote, materials that you'll find in the bookstores, Christian bookstores, that I happen to have run into, let me put it limited to my own limited experience, are irrelevant to the third-party stewards. You've got lots of books there on how to keep your personal finances tidy and lots of things on there, how you should tithe and so forth. That's all fine. But for someone to try to apply, say, Romans, where you should owe no man anything, saying, gee, I'm not going to let this corporation carry any debt, that's dumb. It's, an un- it's unrealistic. In fact, you'll have a higher cost of capital for your shareholders, if that's true. Use of le- proper use of leverage in a business is essential. So what do you mean by owe no man anything? Well, that has to do with bondage and being indebted to in a different sense. It has to do with, I, be- I personally believe, it has to do with personal unsecured loans beyond your means to repay and so forth. In that sense, that you owe someone, that you become enslaved. Now, I owe this young man over here approximately half a million dollars on that one thing. And I don't feel indebted to him. I do have an obligation to inform of my situation, and if I have an adverse, materially adverse reversal, I tell him right away to maintain my credibility. But if he decides, gee, he doesn't like the cut of my jib and he wants to call the loan, I can walk across the street and, you know, probably, for the purpose of this discussion, I'll assume, I can get an equivalent loan. So it's a, it's a supply and demand competitive situation. Am I enslaved to him? I don't think so. I owe him some business <coughs> etiquette and ethics because they're collateralized and so forth and what have you. And um, so I don't think I'm in a position of owing him something in the spirit of Paul's remark, owe no man anything, in the sense that, in contrast to that, I was in a situation where the extension on my visa card some years ago was improper because I was borrowing money I didn't have or what have you. I mean, I could put it that way. Or put it another way, there's probably people in this room that are more in bondage by borrowing, you know, overdrawing their visa card by $1,000 than I might be from borrowing half a million dollars in the right circumstances from Bank of America. So the bondage issue is what Paul is dealing with, not the fact that you happen to incur debt. Proper use of debt is as essential to, to, to a viable enterprise as getting the right kind of power tool or what have you if you understand the cost of capital and financing and the rest of it. And in today's tax structure and, and uh, so forth, it's a 
you know, I, I, I don't regard that as a, a major issue. If it is, we can get into questions and stuff. But I would like, before I get into some uh, carpet remarks, oh, I, I guess, I guess I, I wanted to get sort of out of the way some front end remarks, just from where I'm coming from as a professional executive. Um, as I mentioned in the first hour, and I'll be repeat because I think it's important to sort of put in perspective. Um, let me speak of myself economically, first of all. My parents were foreign born, so I grew up as a first generation American. No inherited wealth or anything like that. Um, ended up um, really operating out of initially after graduating from college and getting the defense industry, operating as a salaried engineer for a while, and then gradually getting into some marketing things and gradu- eventually taking the big, getting some executive credentials. So I was recruited by Ford in a very unusual opportunity. But took my big leap in 68 to start my own company, which after a year or two uh, was uh, acquired by a New York Stock Exchange firm, and that gave me a certain modest measure of independence. And what I did after that was to operate as a freelance consultant in mergers and acquisitions, and I got on several boards and applied my craft that way. But I tend by temperament to be very volatile and a high-risk kind of guy. I'm not security-oriented. I'm adventure-driven. My personality, my background, I'm just very incurably optimistic, and that's part of my makeup. So my, what might be good for me or my attitudes may not be valid for you. As I told the first hour, which you should put at the head of your notes, is Acts 1711. In other words, I don't want you to believe anything I tell you. I want you to search the scriptures and prove whether these things be so, on the one hand. On the other hand, I think part of the value of spending an hour together is perhaps to be very candid with you and at least let you know one, some prejudice of a guy who's been a Bible-believing, born-again um, servant, bond servant of Jesus Christ for, well, since I was 14. And I'm 46, so that's a long time. I've been really walking with the Lord properly in some sense, only four years, because that's when the Lord straightened out my marriage of 23 years, my wife and I being both born again before we were married, but just discovered the real secret to a personal walk four years ago. And that's all on tape from the firefighters, if you're interested. Basically, it involves uh, the supernatural basis of marriage. But um, uh, what I was getting at is, though, the thing that I think will focus attention here in this group is that in the summer of, if if my memory serves me correctly, it was the spring, or maybe summer, April, May time period of 1975, when uh, Carolyn and Walt, two Christian, a Christian couple, were very close friends, (coughs) came to our home and brought us a carton of groceries so we could eat. Uh, We were really messed up financially. I don't want, uh, in, in effect, for practical purposes, I was broke. We kept it a big, dark secret, didn't think anyone knew, tried to struggle and figure out what we do. And one day they just somehow sensed, somehow the Lord told them, sensed, they actually brought us groceries. Now, that was, what, call it five years ago. And um, I'm now in a situation where it happens that my income is in excess of a million dollars a year. Now, the question is, what's happened between then and now? And if I told you it was this, I'd be lying to you. If I told you it was because I was well-trained, there are better, better trained guys doing what I'm doing that haven't been as successful. If it's because of some executive leadership thing at Western Digital, as the press would like you to believe lately, that's a bunch of baloney. Um, people who are inside observers believe it's supernatural, and I do too. Now, the question is why? That's a question I can't answer simply. I mean, part of this hour is, is at least going to walk around that subject a little bit. But before I get to some of that, let me get off some pet peeves, because I'll also mention while we've been successful over the last 10 years, in some respects, particularly in the last five, I've also I've, I've won a few and I've lost a few. I'll tell you something very, very honestly. Most of the money, the best of my memory, the Lord may call me to task as I go through my records and realize that I have maybe exaggerated slightly, but I don't think so. The money, I've made some big money, and I've also lost some money. In every case that I can think of where I've lost money, it's been at the hands of a Christian. It's been in, the, in and uh, as I look back on the complex situations that evolve, there's a common theme among them. Now, some of them were just bum deals, which I should have been smarter. But on the other hand, I've been in some bum deals that have made me a lot of money. I mean, look at deals that if I really analyzed it and realized all the facts, I wouldn't have the guts to go into it. But we did, and we won, and so... I'm not sure that's a magic key. I'm not saying you shouldn't be diligent, but that isn't the magic answer. 
I can tell you one thing, though, that I've suffered badly at, and I mention it because I think there's a lesson. I believe that there's a major lack within the Christian community of a concept that I will call the sanctity of a commitment. One of the things that fascinates me is a, 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 an extreme contrast between two groups of people. One group of people mean well. They attended Calvary Chapel. In there, they discovered the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit's operating in their life, and there's some exciting, solid, valuable spiritual things happening. Don't want to disparage that. However, they get into some deal because something's going to brew, they're going to form a company, or they're going to get into this, that, or another deal, and they sort of say, hey, we're going to go this way, and they sort of agree to go down path X, right? Some of the people they're involved with start making commitments. Some of the commitments are financial. Some of them are just questions of reputation or context or other things. And some time goes by, and they meet again. Well, I know we said that, but we've been praying about it lately. And it seems the Lord is leading us over this way, the theory Y rather than theory X or something. Hey, but I, in the meantime, have done... Yes, I'm sure, sorry. I'm sure the Lord will help you out of that hole you got yourself into <laughs> on the strength of the fact that I said I was going to do X and really ended up doing Y. And this fuzzy thinking is not a function of intent to harm, quite the contrary. But it's, there is a lack of sophistication, a lack of understanding of business etiquette, the lack of understanding business ethics that, frankly, terrifies me to do business when I discover someone is, quote, a Christian, unquote. I had a very close friend, uh, so I can speak freely, I won't identify his name, but he's a very, he was, he, he's a very prominent Christian attorney. And... Um, when somebody walks into his office and says, oh, am I glad I found a Christian attorney, he's discovered over 20 years that that means one thing. You know what it means? He's not going to get paid. That's right. Either up front or de facto. <clears throat> you go to a Christian doctor who has a lot of Christian and some other clients and have him pull open his file drawer and say, hey, which are the uncollectible receivables? Which one are the, del excuse me, the del delinquent receivables? And which ones are the ones paid on time? Which ones do you think are the Christians, the, the delinquent receivables. Now, is that because they're bad people? No. They're not dishonest in the sense of, gee, would I defraud somebody? Because they don't think that way. But what they don't understand is that weak men hurt people. Indecisiveness, vacillating on a commitment, can murder someone that's two or three tiers away in, in transactions or involvements. And it's really not a function of morality. <coughs> it's a function of training or sophistication or etiquette. And there's such an intense attempt to try and be responsive to the leading of the Spirit, and I don't disparage that, but it, yield, it, le it leads to a type of behavior that can be, and frequently is, uh, amazingly injurious to those people around them. Some vendor who's depending on net 30 days, can go under if it's 50 or 60 days repeatedly. And uh, the cost of capital being what it is, the prime rate going, right, we're today we happen to be make, having this discussion, it's what, 18.5%? Is that what it went to today? And one of the impacts of that isn't just the question of availability of cash, it ex it, it's an expression of what time is worth, what a day early in delivery might mean or what have you. And that's the only inelastic supply any of us have, is time. You sitting in this room here have probably something on the order, ignoring eschatology for the moment, just dealing in actuarial terms. We have what? Maybe 1,500 weekends left? 2,000 weekends? How many years you got multiplied by 50? That's how many weekends you got left. You can't add to that. That's if, that's if you're actuarially normal. That's ignoring the rapture, ignoring the fact that you might drive the way I do in my Ferrari at night. I mean, get taken the first car. Um, that was the thing, by the way. I, I, I get kidded a lot about, and, I, and that was the question I raised. The first question: You can a Christian own a Ferrari? That was the theme of the first first thing. And uh, uh, and if you wonder what that was all about, you can get the tape or 
talk to somebody. <laughs> um, I don't want to get back off that subject. Um, now, this, I, this concept of sanctity commitment, though, happens to be something that I'm really hot under the collar about because, um, you know, Lord Chesterfield had a definition of a gentleman. And I, 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 I'm very fascinated. Lord, Chest, Lord Chesterfield's definition of a gentleman was someone who is never unconsciously rude to anyone. And I was always fascinated by that definition because it allows for the idea of being consciously rude. A gentleman can be consciously rude when he tends to be. The great tragedy in life is when we're unconsciously rude. If Dennis is here and I'm, I'm, I'm teed off at him for some reason and I deliberately offend him, that's a valid communication. It communicates. It has a role. But if I do something that I unknowingly offend him, that's gross. That's clumsy. That's injurious because I don't know I've offended him. And that's what happens in business continually among Christians. Not only Christians, but it's Christians that we're dealing with tonight. And I say it's more prevalent among Christians in my personal experience because they're generally more, less sophisticated, the ones I'm talking about. Secondly, they're so wrapped up in trying to walk by the Spirit and listen to the leading of the Lord. I'm not knocking that. But they're so wrapped up in that, they're not sensitive to the fact that they've got to vote. When they give a commitment, that commitment should be binding. There should be no disparity between their verbal word and their written word. You know what the Japanese do with the contract? Have you ever been to it? Have you been in contract with one of the major Japanese trading companies? You know what? The, you know what the closing ceremony when Fujitsu funded Amdahl? You know what the what, at, at the closing meeting for the money? They take the contract, the original contract, and they bring in a big silver bowl and they burn it. It's a traditional Japanese ceremony because the value of the contract is meaningless. It's the relationship and the bond and the mutuality that that contract is brought that's going to endure. Now, obviously, they do have copies of contracts. For the point, the concept, though, <laughs> why? Why do they do so? Why do they have the written ones? That's right, because memories are poor. Never underestimate the capability of the human being to rationalize after the fact. So, yes, it serves a purpose to, to document history. But the spirit of the relationship is interesting. It's a, it's a question of mutuality. No one is kidding anyone if you're dealing in a contractual situation that's an I got you kind of situation. Bait and switch, all those kinds of things. Now, I, I have to give you a story that I think is will dramatize what I'm getting at. In uh, 1968, I believe it was, I had the opportunity. I, was, I, was the, I ran the Ford Motor Company Computing Center in Dearborn, Michigan. I had for some years, a few years, and I also, during that time, set up a worldwide computer network for Ford at a time when that was a very new thing to do, mid-60s, time-sharing, basic, all that kind of stuff if you're in the computer world. And it was a hot area, so we, myself and several key guys, left the Ford Motor Company, um, it was a, and it was, a, it was a typical startup kind of situation, spin-out, as some people call it. And... Um, we had done a number of things, got the thing started, but we sat down at the attorney's office after about a month of other thrashing about and getting things started to have the first formal board meeting of the new corporation. And what happens in a board meeting, the first board, technically the laws typically require a notice being given to directors 15 days before the meeting. And when you call a board meeting like that, the first thing you do is you sign a document which waives the right of notice just to get the meeting legal. It's a routine mechanic that is done before that kind of a board meeting. As this formal routine document was going around, I started to sign it as president and chief executive officer of this corporation just formed. I stopped and I was shocked and I made, a, I made the following statement, which is true. At that moment in the attorney's office, I could say the following things. We had a Delaware corporation formed. We had six key people quit their jobs and were at work, in some cases for several weeks. I had a pair of $3 million computers on their way from Maynard, Massachusetts to Ann Arbor, Michigan. I had a million two hundred thousand dollars in cash deposited at Manufacturers National Bank in Detroit. And I, all this was done without a single scrap of paper being signed by Chuck Missler or any of the other key principals. Isn't that amazing? Now, because as I signed this waiver of notice, I was struck by the fact that this was the first document I was signing as president of this new corporation. 
Uh, it's amazing how much we've done without a scrap of paper. How can that be? Well, very simple. You can create a Delaware, if you're an attorney of repute, of, of substance, you can make a phone call to the corporate, tes- corporate trust company of Delaware and form a corporation in an hour. They put, they put temporary directors, and then they resign when they're real directors. You know, they're, they're attorneys. Go through the mechanics. That's standard procedure in any corporation. They'll file and handle that through, through a temporary delegate directors. And then when the, when the corporation gets together, they step down the new one. It's just a mechanic. It's a norm, It sounds screwy if you're not familiar with it. It's a standard me- mechanical procedure. So that had already been done. It's a phone call. That's trivial. A million two hundred thousand dollars had been deposited by a variety of some almost 50 or 60 investors, typically investors that either knew me or one of the other key investors, that uh, put in the money, deposited into a trust account. Dennis does those things all the time. If you're forming some kind of special enterprise, be it a limited partnership or tax or whatever, you can form out a trust and people who are tending, given certain rules will deposit it in the bank. That just happens. Okay. Um, thirdly, the six guys, all, we all knew each other, and they quit and going on it with the idea of covering. Uh, Ken Olson, the president of the Digital Equipment Corporation, knew me from before, and I said, oh, I told him what I wanted to do, and these were hard to get, and he reserved a couple for me and set it all up, knowing that I would cover him in writing after the corporation was formed. At the time I asked him to do this, the corporation wasn't physically in existence. So he took it on faith, because he knew me. Now, what's interesting to me, and at, the, at, at this time, I have no personal insight into the spiritual condition of Ken Olson, or any of the I mentioned, or any of the several very, very internationally prominent investors that backed me in that venture, I'm going to assume for this discussion that they're not Christians. I have no reason to believe they were, and if I'm doing injury to them, I apologize because that's not my intent. I can put it. Let me put it another way. I have a strong personal belief that one or several of the key investors were very, very amoral people in the sense of maybe in terms of fornication, adultery, or their lifestyle, or you name it. They were men of the world in the, in the, in, in the classical sense of that word. So I, I'm going to argue for the purpose of our discussion tonight. There isn't, there, there's no morality in their lifestyle that you and I would subscribe to as Bible-believing uh, Christians, followers, bond slaves of Jesus Christ. And yet, their ethics were higher and tighter than any of ours in this room, probably. Why? Because Alan, one of the guys I'm making reference to, and I won't mention by name so I can be free about it, his name is known in the financial community of every major country in the world. It happens to be his lifestyle. He's got a reputation that's impeccable because he's a prince of a guy, the most finest executive I've ever had the privilege of working with. I have no insight as to whether he's faithful to his wife or not, or what else he might do. That's a, I'm just, that's a blank page in my scorecard. But he is known throughout the world that if he says he's going to do something, it's going to happen. If he says that, hey, you've got 100 grand, you'll have it by Monday. You can bank on it. Monday it'll be there. Why? Because his lifestyle demands that the entire financial, the sophisticated financial community can rely on that. That's his main working tool. It's not his... It's not his uh, any of several other things, it's his reputation for being ethical. Nothing to do with moral. What I'm trying to do by this episode is to separate morality and ethics. You can be moral, you can be faithful to your wife, you can tithe your income, you can go to uh, the all, uh, services every night of the week at Calvary Chapel and be in an interesting, meaningful spir- growth cycle spiritually and still be guilty of gross unethical behavior in the business community. Be, and, and some of that may be due to lack of training. In fact, I'm going to argue that probably most of it is due to lack of sophistication. Not realizing that when you make a commitment, that the key issues you've got to fulfill up. And by the way, don't misunderstand. I am gross at that. I have something, I think, 150 phone messages on my desk that I have not returned. Part of that's because I'm driven to saturation because of some event events of the last few months, and part of it's just because I've been disorganized, sloppy, and confused. So don't misunderstand. (laughs) Don't let me, by standing up here, give you the impression that, hey, guys, this is the way I did it. No, it's not my intention. What I'm really trying to say is I have been a victim of abuse by Christians, and it's bothered me as to what's going on, because they're not bad people. Christ died for them, and they know it. So there are obviously no more or less sinners in the world at large, the difference is they're forgiven, fine. And they also love the Lord. I have been involved in some Christian publishing enterprises where the suppliers 
the customers and the principals are all Christians. And they have been the biggest business disaster of my career. Because no, you can't rely on anybody. I had warehouse of stock that was broken into by one of the, one of the co-investors with stock removed. It's missing. Were they stealing? No. It turned out they had a need, and they went ahead and they broke into the inventory to, to, to meet this particular spiritual need. They were well motivated. The circumstances as they finally emerged were very, very understandable. Now, what that did to our inventory records, what that did to our royalty liabilities to the people who were the authors of that product, took us, I don't think we ever straightened it out. Just because, not because it was that big amount, the confusion, the secondary effects of trying to figure out, okay, what was in there and did they get it or wasn't it and which version, you know, and, and the chaos. Uh, just one anecdote. The person meant well, you know, at, um, and I could go on through a lot of anecdotes. The thing that I summarize from this experience I'm just disturbed by is that men who are normally in business very diligent, because they're Christian, oh, and specifically if they're dealing in a Christian occupation, you know, like a, one of these uh, ministry kinds of businesses, tend to get loose, sloppy, undiligent, if I can put it that way, lack of diligence, in, uh, undiligent, the way to say it. anyway, um, they uh, uh, take license under the name of Christ. And I, by incidentally, I suspect I could build a biblical case that that's a form of blasphemy. I hadn't thought about it in those terms. All I know is that it, it is of my, my, my recent decade of executive experience, my biggest frustration in the Christian community is the absence of any concept of the sanctity of a commitment. Now that phrase happens to be uh, rather uh, indelibly mentioned in the press because I really come from some 20 years in the computing industry and about three years ago I got into the semiconductor industry. I took over a computing company. The United California Bank asked me to step into a Chapter 11 situation where Western Digital was in Chapter 11. And uh, after getting it out of Chapter 11, after a year or two of beginning to make some progress that company, we started to, to grow out of it. I was asked to speak in uh, Palo Alto to an annual in, in, you know, semiconductor industry update. And I have to tell you, I you know, had some fun with that because I gave them after, a, in a 55-minute presentation, I gave them 50 minutes of history of how we did and here's what we found and here's our products and all that stuff. Last five minutes, I said, hey, I've got to tell you guys, in Silicon Valley, which is the, you know, the heartland, if you will, of the semiconductor industry, that going from any industry in the semiconductor industry is like going from a condiment to a brothel. And I took them apart, too, because of the absence of the sanctity of a commitment in that industry. Now, I've been in some tough industries. The, the automobile business is no picnic. Those guys are tough. There are people that vend <coughs> bolts to the industry that make the profit on the scrap out of the hole. And I'm not kidding. That's really the way. That industry is thin, tight, and tough in terms of costing and what have you. It's a tough industry. However, if you're Ed Hayes of Kelsey Hayes dealing with Ford Motor Company and you've got a brake problem in the plant, first of all, if he's got a brake problem, the first people to hear about is his customer so they can plan and know and realize what's happening. And we put a team of engineers out there to help him get out of the problem. Why? Because next year, the contract's, there's going to be another contract. And who's he going to sell to? Ford, GM, and Chrysler taking the classic big three in my model. I won't get into current affairs right now. Um, and the point is, it's a small club. And you don't take advantage of a guy across a, a table this year and expect to have a hearing next year. It's based on mutuality. And that's got nothing to do with being nice guy, bad guy. It has to do with the cost of marketing being too high. To, you know, to keep creating customers that you you know, mess up last year and now you look for a new one. Cost of marketing for new customers is too high to operate that way. Semiconductor industry is just beginning to learn that. And uh, incidentally, because I made those cracks in terms of the sanctity of commitment to, the, to vendors, to customers, to your own employees, to yourselves, that has made that in industry, uh, gives, it, gives it some vestiges of, of moral bankruptcy, ethical, I should say, eth ethical bankruptcy. And... Uh, Frankly, Western Digital, while I'm sure it isn't perp uh, perp uh, perfect and has a lot of problems, the one thing we've been able to do in the last few years is to try and change some of those styles that happen to characterize the freewheeling, wild, and woolly semiconductor industry. Um, I didn't really want to get into an into a industry discussion, but uh, because of that crack up there in that conference, which was, what, February of 79, I guess, the press picked that up, and there's been a lot of, 
a lot of the visibility of that that, uh, that thing. Um, now, something else I might mention, since we're talking about uh, uh, a corporate uh, issue, I'd like to talk about another executive in another company. And in order to speak freely, I won't try to identify who it is. But there's a there there are cases where a Christian chief executive officer of a publicly owned company um, wears his biblical position on his sleeve and does great damage to both the company and the evangelical community. There have been cases where the uh, uh, first of all, the behavior itself is probably a little kooky, candidly. But furthermore, the press picks it up and has a field day with it and destroys everybody's welfare. The shareholders are convinced that the company's run by a bunch of nuts, Bibles in the boardroom and all that sort of thing. Um, there are cases where the products were not working right, so the chief executive went out on the assembly line and laid hands on the thing and prayed for the machine. Now, that makes great reading in some charismatic journal. It strikes terror in the heart of a customer who says, gee, are the products I'm receiving dependent on their prayers to work? You know, the whole thing has, you know, some very, very candid, it sounds humorous, but some very, very serious repercussions. And I'm going to mention this because at Western Digital, some people are really shocked by some of the things we do. For example, all of you here at Calvary know that I've been very active as a Bible nut for, what, 10 years. And... Um, some people are startled at Western Digital, even our president, chairman, and chief executive officer, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, that, gee, I don't lead the company Bible study. I didn't even organize it. Try to stay as far away from it as I can. Uh, at employee meetings, generally, there's a few exceptions. At Thanksgiving, we give every employee a turkey, and we do some things now and then there. But in general, I don't lead the company employees in a prayer. Rarely, certainly not each morning. Um, now, you may say, gee, and a, lot, and a lot of Christians in Orange County are really upset. Gee, Chuck, you're a board at Calvary Chapel, and you're you know, virtually on staff there. And, and, and uh, uh, gee, we, we, we'd like to organize the uh, greater Orange County or Irvine or whatever Bible study and stuff. And would you help organize? See, absolutely not. No way. Why? Because it would be absolute spiritual death to that enterprise. A group of guys have organized a Bible study. And it can't say, hey, by the way, we meet on Friday noons at the such and such, and would you be willing to come and speak? You know, we understand you got this Monday night thing and all that. I says, gee, um, I'll be glad to swing by now and then at random when no one knows I'm coming. Why? Because I'm the president of the company. And I'll screw your Bible study all up. Because the president goes, half the people who come will be there because the boss is there and they think it's right and all that stuff. And incidentally, that is not necessarily obsequious behavior. At the Ford Motor Company, there were two buildings. The engineering staff, which was some 3,000 engineers, was in one area of building run by a guy, a guy by the name of Herb Mish, vice president of engineering. And uh, an equivalent engineering group across the street in another big building was the Ford Division Product Engineering Office, which ran under a chief engineer, Hans Matthias. And it happens that Hans Matthias is one of these guys, or used to be one of these guys. This is, this is a long time ago, so I don't think I'm, I think I'm, I'm assuming these guys may have been retired by now. But Hans Matthias was a style that he'd always work in his shirt sleeves. Come to work, take off his coat, hang it on his back of the door, and he'd be at his desk in his shirt sleeves. Okay? And um, it turns out it isn't very long when people in that building work in their shirt sleeves. You go to some guy, some, some three level down manager, and he's in his shirt sleeves. Is he copying the boss? Not consciously. He just know people just tend to do that. If we get in a meeting and I take off my coat, you'll all take off, you know, you just do. Over in engineering staff, Herb Mish always had his coat and tie, it was just his personal style. And guys just tended to do that. Over in truck engineering, Holly Co Hardy Cop never wore a tight clip. It just happened to be he, that was just his thing. And you'll discover that his engineers never wore tight clips. Now, what's funny about that, you know, a guy like William White in the organization, man, will take some behavior like that and make a big thing of it. You know, the, the corporate sycophants, you know. Nonsense, because the, 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 the behavior isn't conscious. We tend, we're creatures of, of conformity. You may superficially conform. It doesn't mean you have to think conformist. But you tend to adopt the tribal modes of behavior. And you could spot in a meeting sometimes. You could often tell who are the, who are the engineering staff, the four division guys. Do they have the code on or not? And I suspect you, you do a statistical sample and get a, you know, a correlation, a co coefficient. 
What I'm saying is, is if the boss is going to Bible studies every Friday noon, a lot of people will go through the motions without the, you know, it'll be all form and no substance. I think there's real risks. Now, on the other side of the coin, um, and I'm not saying this is right, by the way. This just happens to be Chuck Missler's way of handling uh, his situation at Western Digital. Um, the credibility of the company on Wall Street. Well, let me back up and tell you a few things that have happened at Western Digital because it'll show you, that it'll, it'll, I think it'll highlight that poor planning's got nothing to do with it. Western Digital was in Chapter 11 in 1977, was almost purchased by United Technology for $5 million. Today, Western Digital is worth about $200 million on the public stock exchanges. We have 5,000 shareholders. We operate. We have things going on in 30 countries. Serve 1,000 corporate customers, no one of, only one of which is over 10% of sales. A week ago Saturday, I had the opportunity to have the, the employees together and I handed out certificates of participation in the Employee Stock Ownership Trust that were collectively worth $14 million. Three, almost three times what the company was worth three years ago was handed out as an employee benefit. And I should explain, by the way, that doesn't mean you can run out and cash them. There's a 10-year vesting. If you're there one year, you get 10%. It, it, you, you're 100% best after 10 years. And what we do each year, you know, up to, under the tax laws, up to 14, 15% of payroll can be put in stock in the trust any one year, no cost to the employee. And if he, if he stays there, he has those number of shares, whatever they're worth then. And, you know, it's a, it's a classical employee stock ownership trust. It's an interesting mechanic because people who leave the company, say after three years, 30% is vested. 70% that's unvested is what's called a forfeiture. That gets spread to the employees that hang around. And so whenever someone leaves the company, we have a going away party where we celebrate his contribution <laughs> to the rest of us. And uh, in, in, th in, the three, in, the, in, the, in the first quarter of this fiscal year, I think the people that left the company forfeited over half a million dollars. And it's exciting. <laughs> And when I have a new employee group sitting together, I say, look around, so I figure out who's got the largest unvested share and get them to quit. You know, And so that's part of our answer to the turnover problem that plagues our electronics industry. As you probably know, it's a wild and woolly thing, and, and people are what it's all about. So that's, uh, it's a very self-serving technique because uh, it's a way we create a cadre of trained, experienced people who work together, and that's our major asset. And, uh, but that's, I don't want to get into the Western Digital story, except to say I do want to highlight just a few things, namely that the progress at Western Digital has been awesome, so awesome as to command the attention of uh, all the major Wall Street houses. We just had a public offering of some additional shares. We had 63 major firms syndicate the thing. The uh, $28 million worth of stock was sold in 50 minutes when this market opened, and uh, 50 minutes it was gone. Um, so I say that in a sense of sensitivity to the company and its progress, um, what I'm going to lead up to is, is that um, some of the executives that were there in the troubled period noticed something change in the company in the summer of 77 when I happened to walk on board. And incidentally, they don't necessarily, don't misunderstand me, they're not attributing it to me personally. But in a point of time from that day on, something different was happening at Western Digital. And the comments have been made by several of the executives to their wives, and of course it gets back through the grapevine and what have you, that something supernatural is happening in Western Digital. Now, my argument to you is that I believe that the testimony of deeds and style and atmosphere within the company is a far more meaningful validation of one's faith and commitment to lordship than making comments to the press that will be taken by Satan's tools and warped and twisted and used as injury against both the company and the shareholder's interest, on the one hand, and the validity of the evangelical community on the other. And all I'm suggesting is, and I'm not saying that what I'm doing is the best or the right thing at Western Digital. It just is what a what I happen to be doing. But I raise it because I do believe that it's not necessarily obvious as to how you should witness. I don't think running around the hallways at Western Digital and passing out tracts would be constructive either to Western Digital or to the Lord's work. 
And I'm going to argue to you that there are, you know, the Wycliffe translators have a style that I think that we all forget. The Wycliffe translators, when they go into a tribe, have a rule. And that is you live with the tribe. And I'm going to argue to you that there are, you know, the Wycliffe translators have a style that I think that we all forget. The Wycliffe translators, when they go into a tribe, have a rule. And that is you live with the tribe. If the tribe you're dealing with has, lives in grass huts, you live in grass huts. You don't build, you don't have a tent up on the hill or something. And um, you eat their food, you dress their dress, for the most part, because you integrate with the tribe. That's the concept. And yet, I, th I think the same thing's true at work. And I'm going to argue to you that the combination of what the Lord has done for me here at Calvary Chapel and what the Lord has done for me in the executive suite has given me a ministry that some of the best ministers in the land could not reach. Um, in terms of credibility in the corporate boardroom, for example. Uh, credibility before the Senate in Washington. Uh, because I am not <clears throat> a man of the cloth, if you know what I mean. Right? I'm Chuck Missler, uh, you know, an executive that's in the electronics industry. And, and um, when... That's interesting. I hadn't thought about it until just now. A year ago in November, I had the opportunity to share a platform with Menachem Begin in Israel. Um, our plane had a military escort from, from Tel Aviv to Amsterdam. It had nothing to do with my relationship with Calvary Chapel, per se, although that's why I was there. It had to do with one's position that the Lord put you in, which it leads me to, by the way, the first hour's topic, the whole idea of wealth. Love of money is the root of all evil, the Scripture tells us. Yes, at the same time, the Lord can also use wealth. He did it in the case of Abraham. He did it in the case of you know, Joseph and Daniel and others in terms of power, executive position, and the rest, for his purposes. And some of you in this room have a ministry that the Lord would have you do of command, of resources, or wealth, or what have you. And that ministry is something that can be closed to you if you harbor traditional notions about wealth and the Christian. And... Um, it also, it's a, it's a ministry that can be closed to you if you're not effective in your business relationships. And, I, and, I, and by effective, I mean uh, effective in, in, in every sense of the term. And not just, uh, not just that comfortable, cop-out, monastic theory that most of us adhered to when we get into a Christian walk. The monastery theory of the Middle Ages was wrong. The Lord did not call you to a monastery to withdraw from the world physically. He called you to be separate, yes, but not to be in a monastery. You can't witness in a monastery. That's Satan's most effective t technique to seal your life off from visibility to those that it ought to influence. And most of us in a Christian walk have a mo monastery theory. We love to find some little cocoon we can withdraw to Oh, I would love to go join a company where they're all Christians, where they don't swear and cuss and what have you, and where at lunch hour we can have a Bible study every noon. People who have tried organizing those things find in the general case, not everywhere, they often fail. And it's possible that it may fail because the Lord wants them to. Because the Lord doesn't want you there. He wants you out where they are, cussing and swearing and wife swapping on the weekends. Why? Because that's the people that Christ died for. And that's where you got to be. Now, to have credibility in that group, you ought to be successful. And the way, and, 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 or let me be more precise, you ought to be diligent. Now, I'm getting off the subject, I guess, because I've wandered here a little bit. Um, I had an outline, but I think I've, I've told you more than I know about it anyway. Um, let me throw it open for questions, and that will probably remind me of things that I should have said and didn't. Yes, young lady. I'm not sure I can paraphrase everything you've said, but the real question is, is the Christian's self-consciousness about wealth coming from a traditional denominational background where wealth is something to be frightened of. And incidentally, I'm sure it is. I think wealth is probably more dangerous than most things we might list as a threat to our spiritual walk. And, um, and that should be said and should be focused. I haven't focused on it because I think that gets, if anything, an overemphasis in most Christian communities. So I've sort of tried to look at the other side of it. I think... Um, that um, the fear, the self-consciousness of wealth. If I, let me put it this way: If I was Satan, 
trying to keep you from centers of influence. I would probably try to keep you away from centers of wealth. Or if I exposed you to those centers of wealth, I would love to do it in a way where your credibility wasn't taken seriously. So one of the things that I think Satan would fear the most is for Christian believers to be validly positioned in positions where they can influence or communicate with centers of influence, be they public relations centers of influence, be they governmental centers of influence, or be they executive chambers of other kinds. So I tend to believe that there are, minist- there are barriers and opportunities to ministries. Some of us here can minister to one community, others couldn't. There's a lot of communities that I would be just as inept, uncommunicative, not you know, take, you know, just written off as other people around here would be if they tried to witness to uh, the you know, chairman of the board of the Ford Motor Company or somebody that I might have commerce with because I used to work or something. You know, I, what I'm saying is we have our communities. And um, so uh, uh, I'm not sure I've really answered your question other than uh, you say that um, um, from, you asked me a comment about um, my well. I guess, uh, first of all, I have, to, I have to put it right up front that my use of the resources God has given me, I'm sure, is inept, clumsy, and confused. Uh, the only defense I make, it's probably no more inept, clumsy, or confused than other parts of my life, so I'm not sure that's... Uh, the only the thing I the thing that I have told Romaine repeatedly is that Christ died for Ferrari owners too. Okay. Um, what did Romaine say? <laughs> but incidentally, well, <laughs> love that guy. Uh, incidentally, I would not uh, I would not rationalize my particular vehicle on this basis. On the one hand, on the other hand. I will, I could conjure up specific anecdotes where the communication that I have with some people is quite different now than if I was driving a, say, Mercedes limousine or something. It's a different ballgame. Well, as a matter of fact, it's interesting. I have an anecdote that one of the, the top managing partners of one of the world's most effective investment bankers in the world that handled, incident, happened to handle our public offering. Um, and we traveled a roadshow together. We hit, uh, I think, uh, 15 cities in 10 days, meeting breakfast, noon, and night, met at the airport with limousines, having meeting, syndicating this investment thing. And uh, I'll, make two, I'll make two facts to you. One night after this roadshow, Houston, Dallas on a Friday, Chicago on Monday, New York breakfast, lunch, dinner in Boston, San Francisco breakfast, lunch in L.A. same day, and on. In this kind of a thing, we got very close. And obviously one evening, after the last portfolio manager finally left the Dudane, we're sitting there, and, and uh, my financial officer and this other gentleman, we got talking about a lot of things. And we got talking about, what, what do you think is going to happen in the Middle East? And I told him. And we talked about Ezekiel 38. And we talked about um, all those things. Now, what's interesting was he happens to drive a Ferrari. And so do I, as you may know. Now, by the time we got to that discussion, I wasn't a client. We had a lot in common. We talked about the Bob Bondurant Professional School of Grand Prix Driving, which I just got through here a few weeks ago. And we had a relationship where we both were at, okay? And uh, I don't know how many million, he, I, I forget what their fee is. You can figure a fee on something like this is 8% of the placement. It's a $28 million deal. So he's making some money on us, and we did very well. We multiplied our net worth of the company by a factor of four in 30 days. So we both are, we have a lot of reasons to have a very healthy relationship. However, I'm going to argue that every one of those elements builds a basis for communication. Now, I can't, it's not one of these stories where I can point to the specific fruit. One man, one man plants, another man waters. But I, I, I think I could argue that um, the Ferrari can be used. 
Now, do I have the Ferrari because it's a witness? No, I have the Ferrari because it's a flesh trip. Okay? That thing's got a, a V8 fuel injected uh, stride the rear axle, just ahead of the rear axle, and I have a ball. When I go on a routine errand, it's an adventure. That thing, <laughs> that thing will go. That thing will go to 42 and first. And it's redlined at 7,700 RPM. Okay, and it's a lot of fun. Now, I happen not to be a big car buff, where I don't think that that's if 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 I totaled it tomorrow. The next car I might get would be something else, okay? Um, so it's possible that car could be, it may have been, it may be in the future, an idol that I should put to death to keep me from being injured in my walk. That's possible. It's my belief. I may be wrong. It's my belief. And in my life, it isn't. It's not a God I worship. There are, let me put it another way. There's probably other things in my personal walk in my life that are a bigger hindrance to the Lord my fellowship with him than that car. I enjoy the car. I'd be kidding if I said I didn't. It's a lot of fun. It happens to be provided by my company. It happens to have some microprocessors in it, and I won't get into that whole story because that isn't the reason I have it. It's the reason I can write it off tax-wise by the way we handle the thing. But it's got nothing to do with why I really drive it. I drive it because it's fun. It also is not inconsistent with what we're trying to do as a company, it happens. If you've seen our recruiting brochure, you know how we use that thing. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is I'm not trying to sell you a Ferrari. What I'm trying to say, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is anything in your life can cause you to stumble in your walk before the Lord on the one hand. On the other hand, I don't believe that any particular thing in your life is necessarily evil. And uh, uh, I... I'm not sure I'll point to any one particular thing, be it the Ferrari or some other self-indulgences that I have, that are uh, um, um, specific to the point I'm going to make. But I do believe that the collective impact of me being who I am and doing what I do gives me a witness that other people can't reach. There are people in America that I can reach, talk to, and relate the Lord Jesus Christ to in ways that, that other people couldn't. There, there are other evangelists. Uh, you can take Chuck Smith as an example. You can take Walter Martin as an example. You can take Hal Lindsey as an example. And you can make a long list of ministers who have a segment of the society that they have a unique adaptation to. Now, Chuck's perhaps a little unique because he has a broader spectrum of access than most people do. But most guys that are professional evangelists, if I'll put it that way, or ministers, have a style or a, an audience that they can reach. But that's a subset of today's society because society is what it is. And you live somewhere that only you can reach. Don't you think it would be inappropriate for Chuck Smith to drive around in a Ferrari, but it's perfectly appropriate for somebody who is dealing constantly with people who are living in Ferraris? Probably. Isn't there such an argument? Yeah, they were probably right. That, that's true. I'm not sure Paul, when in Rome, did what the Romans do, but I hear what you're saying. Um, you're say, now, now it, let, let's just take that as an example. The only barrier to Chuck Smith driving a Ferrari is the attitudes of the congregation. And by the way, the weakest ones of the congregation. Because I, for one, would be the guy, if he, if he bothered to ask my counsel, would encourage him to. I think that there's members of the younger set that would relate to him. <laughs> seriously. Seriously. Now, I don't know Chuck well enough to know. I don't think car, he ha, you know, everybody has their thing, and I'm not sure you know, a five-speed box with 200 horses on it is particularly his thing. But if it was, I would encourage him. But you raise a good point. The reason for him not to do that is it might cause a brother to stumble. And that's really it. Now, if I believed, and it may be that I'm just very insensitive, but if I believed, that it was a, you know, a, a serious problem, that I'm causing people at Calvary or that have what I'll call in, in some kind of a following sense, that we're stumbling the Christian walk because I'm driving a Ferrari, then that would be a good reason for me not to. That'd be a good reason for me not to. That's right. Now, you put your finger on a very key issue. Yes, sir, back there. Well, I'm not sure I have any influence, but I, I do know that he's biblically very fundamental. 
I don't really have personal knowledge of his beliefs. I've had remarks being made that cause me to suspect that he's uh, he's he, you know he's a lot more center line than we might that than his office or his social predicament might allow him to acknowledge. But I have no personal knowledge. It would be inappropriate for me to comment any further than that, frankly. I had some other questions back here, young lady. Um, by the way, you're driving a Ferrari. You could encourage him, I think. <laughs> I, I rationalize it that way, but I would anyway, because I'm a self, you know, never underestimate the capacity. Well, it, it's, it's, it, some, some people say it's also a prelude to male menopause. I don't know if that's true. Um, I'm sure you know this too, that the Bible doesn't say that money is the root of all evil, it's the love of money. Right on, right on. I, Right. Money, incidentally, that's a very good point. It's the love of money. And secondly, something else. And incidentally, this is true, in my opinion, in the secular world, not just in the Christian world. The guys that I know that have net worths of over $10 million and that, that are in the high roller kind of numbers are not in it for the money. It's a very amazing thing. It may shock, I'm sure a lot of you don't believe me, but the guys that I know that are really winning and love to win, money is simply the medium in which they keep score. It's not the love of the money. Now, by the way, the ambitions that they have and the gods they serve may be just as disastrous, but one of the things I think it's just valuable to understand how life really is, the guys that are driven to growing a corporation or producing the best computer in the marketplace. In fact, I'll tell you frankly, in the industry, one of the biggest problems in the executive suite are guys who are chasing an issue in which money isn't the, pro isn't, the, isn't the goal. Guys who are trying to build the biggest and best computer not looking at the profit. That's a bigger problem. A corporation does not exist to maximize its profit. Peter Drucker made that very clear if you're a student of American industry. Because if you were out to maximize your profit, you would maximize your gross margins and you don't dare do that because you'll draw in unsavory competition if you're smart. There are all kinds of reasons you don't maximize your profit. Well, what do you do then? What is the goal of an enterprise? To create customers. Now, the validation of the decisions you made to create the customer is profit. If you create customers with an earned surplus or a value added, which we call profit, that validates the sequence of decisions you made to make that customer. I have, say, uh, let's assume I had a, uh, a glass cup here, and let's, took, let's assume it took a dollar's worth of materials and a dollar's worth of labor to make this cup. If I can sell that cup for $3, dollars worth of labor, dollar's worth of materials, I've made a dollar extra. I am rewarded a dollar for having assembled that and delivered it to the customer. The dollar profit validates the utility of my taking the trouble to do that. If I create, take a dollar's worth of materials and a dollar's worth of labor and create a cup that I sell to you for a dollar and a half, I have created a crime against society because I have destroyed 50 cents of value. The materials are worth a dollar before I touched them I harnessed the dollars worth of labor could have been applied elsewhere. And if our society was structured, quote, properly, close quote, a cr it would be a crime in business to operate a business at an unscheduled loss because we have injured not only the suppliers and the employees. Well, first of all, we've, not only, we've injured the shareholders because we've destroyed their equity. We've injured the vendors to that enterprise because they no longer have reliability of payment because I'm going to sooner or later run out of money. I've injured the customer because when you want to buy a companion cup to match that one a year later, I won't be in business to serve you. And you, what you thought was open stock ain't. It's now an antique. And you can build a, a model of the economy which points out that your real business is to create customers, and you want to do it validly. And the way we validate our decisions economically is with a profit. But you don't maximize profit. And business executives that are building their international empires aren't driven by dollars. Why? Because they're past the utility curve of money anyway. Taxes and whatever being what it is. But getting a bigger salary or a bigger bonus or a larger net worth <laughs> is simply 
the arbitrary scorecard, no different, really, than a miler that's looking at his lap times. And he's just setting himself a goal to see if he can beat it. And if I made, uh, you know, $10 million last year, this year I'll try to make 20. Western Digital happens to be doubling every year. And, we're, and, and why, what are we driven to do? To grow. Well, for a lot of reasons. Partly to stay self-determined of our destiny and all those things. But um, the, uh, I guess the point I guess I'm making is, is the love of money is the root of all evil. By the way, ambition of any kind can destroy you. But one of the frank realities in life is that someone that's striving is um, um, capable, not necessarily, but capable of being in great spiritual trouble. It doesn't have to be for money. It can be any for a lot of things. Well, we should never strive. Wrong. Paul did. He strove to win. And he was careful about the race he chose to win. Because the real risk in life is that you'll win the race and find out you're running the wrong one. Yes, sir? You know, I get asked that a lot, and I have to be candid with you that I don't have a lot of insight. The question being, uh, you know, what about being unequally yoked in a partnership? The yoked and unequally yoked thing, in my personal opinion, generally applies to marriage and a more intimate thing. However, a partnership is very much akin to that kind of a thing. I understand from friends and so forth that are yoked with unbelievers, but that are very competent, able, ethical people. It's a very successful relationship. And I can't speak to that because I have no personal knowledge. I have to be honest with you. I have an abhorrence of a partnership form. I happen personally to have a bias. It costs you trivial money to incorporate. The tax laws of the country under subchapter S allow you to tax yourself as a partnership, so you have no disadvantage by being incorporated. You have enormous advantages in terms of availed illegal liability. Suppose someone successfully prevails in a lawsuit against your partner under something that was not his fault, but the judge, as the, you know, every courtroom is a roulette wheel. And the, 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 the adversary prevailed, and your partner's got a judgment. You can be stuck. So the, the, the protection of a corporate veil is valuable independent of the merits or demerits of your, quote, partner. And so, as an aside, I just personally happen to have an attitude that, says, that feels that partnerships are obsolete except in those areas in business where they're required by law, as certain places in business are. But they're getting disappeared. Even attorneys that can incorporate professional service corporations, what have you. I happen to believe very strongly in those. You'd be... For the simple reason that you have a, well, two, several, you have a corporate veil against those kinds of acts, so you're protected to what you've got invested no more, so it's a protection. Secondly, the uh, whole idea of, uh, of uh, ownership is now in dividable units. So we can give 5% here or 1%. It's easier to handle without keeping the attorneys in business and amending the articles every time. Yes, and that's, that, that's dealing with the form and not the substance of your question. The next question, you said the real substance of your question is about being unequally yoked. And um, I guess my personal attitude, now this doesn't mean it's right, this is just Chuck Missler's attitude, is my, uh, let me, let me, you all familiar with athletes in action? Okay, where they have a marvelous witness and so forth. Now, what they, I'm going to imagine they do, I don't know that much about them, but I'm just going to hypothesize. What they do is they get the world's greatest high jumper, lead him to the Lord, and then have him lead other athletes to the Lord, right? I want you to notice what they don't do. They don't go down the street and find a neat Christian and try to teach him to high jump. Okay? Now, you're on the operating table. You've got appendicitis. Okay? And... A doctor comes up to you and says, uh, I'm Jewish. And incidentally, I'm an agnostic. I don't buy the Bible. I don't buy Jesus Christ. That happens to be, that's just the way I believe. Now, I happen to be a specialist in appendicitis. And I pull about 17 appendices a week. I have done it for 20 years, and I've just delivered the keynote paper on the world's international appendicitis meeting. Okay. <laughs> and I'm prepared to pull your appendix out, okay? Now, over on the other side of the table, you got a guy who comes up and says, you know, I've never done this before, <laughs> but I've been praying about it, and I believe the Lord is leading me to pull your appendix out. Now, I want you to sit there 
on the table and tell me who you will probably grant the contract to <laughs> pull your appendix. Okay? Now, I have great respect and love for the brother who means well, but I really am not at the point in my spiritual walk to have him pick up a scalpel and pull my appendix. All right? All right. Now, with that rather facetious analogy, let me just continue a little more. At Western Digital Corporation, and I'm the chief executive officer, and, and I, got the, I got a strong outside professional board, but they backed me 100%, so I'm pretty strong. I can pretty much do what I want in terms of making decisions. And if I want, well, as a matter of fact, tomorrow we'll go a press release out. One of the big things in the computing industry is the Ada language. It's going to revolutionize, in my opinion, the computing industry for 20 years. And Western Digital is interested in, in supporting that language in special electronics. And tomorrow, a press release will go out announcing that the a guy by the name of Bill Carlson, who is the program manager for the Advanced Research Projects Agency for the Department of Defense, will be joining Western Digital as the Vice President General Manager of the Advanced Systems Division. Uh, Dr. David Fisher, who was the, in the Office of Secretary of Defense for five years, Institute of Defense Analysis for five years, who's probably the, he's the guy that wrote the ADA requirements eight years ago for the DOD. He's joined us about a week ago as Director of Ar System Architecture. Now, the point is, in going after these executives, I went after what I believe to be the number one and number two guys in the world on ADA. And I may be wrong. We may have number three or four rather than number one, two. I don't know. My point is, in fact, the rumors are already on the street. That's why we're going out the press release. Next week in Boston, there's a world ACM conference on the subject, and Dr. C uh, Carlson will be opening the conference because of his position with the Department of Defense. Dr. Fisher, because... But the word will be out that, hey, they're joining Western Digital, so there'll be some, in that little community, be some buzzword. The point is, when I go after those guys, I mention one thing their character, maturity, and competence as an executive. I don't care just about their technical knowledge. I care about their administrative and managerial maturity, their ability to handle people. I care about their, the, the quality of their character as exemplified by their track record. Um, I have no idea. I've interviewed these guys intensively, we have a close relationship in many respects. I have no idea what Bill Carlson's religious beliefs are. I have no idea whether he's a born-again Christian or not. Dr. Fisher, I don't know either. Do you want to know something? In a sense that we're speaking here, I don't care. Because one of two things are true. They either are born-again believers in Jesus Christ. And when that suddenly comes up, I'll be fascinated and thrilled and I'll praise the Lord for it. If it turns out they're not, I'll be fascinated and thrilled and I'll praise the Lord for it. Because I'll feel the same way Paul did when he was writing his letters, chained to this Roman centurion. <laughs> that poor guy can't get away from me. I can witness to him. Okay? I for, when, I, when, I, when I really got back under the leadership of Chuck Smith in 19, when I first came, discovered Calvary Chapel, I've been a Christian for a long, long time, but I was on the shelf and drifted aside, what have you, and, and it was through, Lord, through Chuck's uh, you know, channel. The Lord really brought me back to an active, vital growth path. And, but it also happened to be at the time that I was also freelancing and sort of doing deals and not really in a you know, doing something. I got in that whole trip of wanting to say, gee, I got this opening, I'm trying to, gee, I need a CPA. Can I find a Christian CPA? I'll be very frank with you, by the way. I'm having a meeting tomorrow morning with a CPA firm, and I'm going to clean up this year. I've been dealing with a Christian CPA firm for years, and I'm not going to deal with them anymore because of, 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 of a lot of professional circumstances. And, uh, but I went through that whole trip, Christian attorney, Christian CPA, and so forth. And at, to be frank with you, I have had enough of it. I'll go, if I have a tax problem, I'll go to the best possible tax guy I can get access to. I don't care where he happens to worship. If he's a Christian, praise the Lord. If he's not, maybe the Lord has... And by the way, that was the big insight as I started forming companies and stuff. Instead of looking for Christians in them and building a monastery, it suddenly dawned on me, yeah, that's really what we're doing, right? It's the monastic theory of evangelism. Okay? And uh, I, I don't believe that. It finally woke up to the fact that the greatest living expert on tax shelters might walk into my office and because of some stratagem, we'll be drawn together to, to create some new investment vehicle and by the way, along the way, he'll discover, you know, he'll say, what's that rock on your desk? Okay. Well, it's the one Bill Twynham gave me. 
It's one of the rocks that didn't cry out on the Mount of Olives. What do you mean didn't cry out? It's got a little plaque on it, you know. Well, that was one of the rocks that didn't cry out when Christ rode there and so forth, and they said he's a Messiah, and the Pharisees tried to, he said, you know, that was the one that didn't. And then, you know, suddenly, well, really? <laughs> I had a guy come into my office, another little plaque there, it says, uh, it's just a, a rock, a little thing, and it says, uh, Revelation 16, 16, it says, he says, uh, uh, what's that? I'm coming in quickly, and I'm thinking, what's that? And I said, uh, I'm not sure you're ready for this. He says, try me. He says, well, and we were in a hurry because we had some other crises, but he says, well, that's a rock from Megiddo. It's the one of the few that won't be radioactive in the next few years. When the Russians invade Israel, after Iran falls, the Russians will invade Israel, and and there's going to be a big battle, and dump 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 and I just I gave him a three quick boom. <laughs> and, he, and he had his computer brain. He looked at that, and he says, gee, you're right. I says, what do you mean? I wasn't ready. And he went... <laughs> That guy's name was Irv Chompsland, and he did that when I was president, the chairman of the board of Precision Instrument Company in Palo Alto. He was in my office about two, three days ago. He says, what was that to you? Tell me about Iran. <laughs> Interesting. Praise the Lord is right. Now, I got, but the point is, we presume that the people that are drawn into our orbit ought to be Christians. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I think when, when, the, when God transported Philip down after the big revival, where's the Philippi? He came across a eunuch in a chariot, right? Or, or correction, uh, Ethiopian, whatever. Yeah, Ethiopian, you know. And because he had a need for Isaiah 53 commentary. So in the middle of this revival, I think it was, it was Philip, right, was transported down there. What am I doing here? There's that one guy, go join yourself to his chariot. So he went there and gave a Bible study. And it probably led to the whole evangelization of North Africa, some scholars believe. So, you know, where's the Lord going to have you witness? I don't know. But now, the question, that really doesn't get the question of you know, being unequally yoked. Um, I personally believe that, in, that when in business, we're not getting married in the sense of a forever thing. If the partnership's properly drawn up, or if the corporation's properly conceived, there's the concept of the takeout. Hey, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and we're going to, if, if it's five years or ten years or wherever, you want liquidity. You want to pass the baton, if it's a corporation. So there's a concept. If it's if it's a privately held situation, you want to buy a sell agreement or whatever. If it's a public corporation, you're going to want a market made so you have liquidity to divest yourself when the time comes. If it's a partnership, hey, it's got a finite life. Ten years, twenty years, it's for a specific purpose. I personally, just an attitude, don't believe that that's yoked necessarily in a spiritual sense. And it could very well be that you might be drawn into a specific project for the sake of having an influence for the Lord. Now, I may be wrong. And I, 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 have, I do not have an adequate sampling of experience to suggest that a Christian guy and, say, an agnostic or atheistic specialist might not properly yoke to develop a piece of property or to structure some kind of portfolio trading model or whatever where their skills were mutually caused in your to, the, in, in, uh, to their mutual benefit. And uh, the drawing together is a witness situation. If it's a long-term, lifetime thing, like maybe a law partnership or a doctor's practice or something might be, that may be something quite a, quite a different thing. And I'm not an expert. How is it that you're not being I listen to Dennis anyway. No. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what? How is it that you're not being counseled or influenced by people who you don't, do not know? Who said I'm not? Well, how do, how do you know? How do I know what? In many counselors, there's wisdom, and I seek all the counsel I can get, okay? Now, frankly, I don't know what your background is, but let's leave it that way to make my model. If I want to figure out what kind of financing I want to cover this peculiar, typical deal, I won't ask you, because you're a spiritual brother, and that's neat, but I am not have no reason to believe you know the difference between term bet and this, that, and the other thing, okay? But I'll go to this guy, not because he goes to Calvary Chapel. In fact, we got drawn into a relationship in business before I happened to know that. He may have known me, but I, frankly, at the time, had no idea that he was at Calvary Chapel. Okay? In fact, the, it, the, the Bank of America head offices pointed me to him. They set it up, and I discovered fortuitously, hey, he's a brother at Calvary Chapel. Terrific. We drew a developed relationship. But we were signing papers before I knew that. I happen to have a board member on my board of directors of Western Digital by the name of Don Tatum, who's chairman of the board of Disney. He's on the board of Bank of, Bank of America's board of directors. 
and uh, uh, three directors of Bank of America came to my wedding. It happens because of people we know. And I happened to have a very peculiar problem. I was disastrously let down by a particular bank in the Irvine area that promised to do something and didn't. Interesting. By the way, they were non-Christians too, so I had been let down by some people who also were non-believers. <laughs> and I was in trouble, and I didn't know who to turn to. I thought, last of all, I'd turn to a big bank like B of A because I need fast action. But I, I called Don and said, who can I call? He says, I don't know, but call so-and-so. He'll at least know who you should call. And I called him on a Wednesday afternoon, Thursday morning in my office, around my coffee table, we did a you know $325,000 loan. Now, that relationship had nothing to do with the fact that the, you know, one of the key managers happens to be a born-again Christian Fellowships Calvary Chapel. That was just the Lord's way of saying, surprise! <laughs> Look what I got for you guys, a little extra, right? So, now, getting back to your thing, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. I don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, if I can help it, if I'm aware of it, in terms of my spiritual walk, in terms of my major personal decisions, etc., okay? But, I wouldn't, and if I have a spiritual problem of moment, or I should say a spiritual problem, if I have a key decision in my life and I need help, I'll go to Chuck. Because that's a personal life decision, career, whatever. I'll go to Chuck Smith. If I have a question of how I should finance the acquisition of a troubled company that we're looking at in Germany because of some deal, I wouldn't go to Chuck. That's not his expertise. Okay? But I'll go to X, Y, or Z who knows something about that because that's the source of that kind of technical counsel. Walking in the counsel of the ungodly in, in Psalm 1 deals with the important things of your life, not the technical details. Yeah, but when you say walk in the counsel, see, I don't regard having a specialist draw up my you know, application for, uh, you know, uh, uh, a uh, small business set-aside proposition of the Air Force and the F-111 is something that I'm concerned about the spiritual condition of the guy doing that contract. I'm really concerned is, is he or is he not the, uh, you know, counsel for the small business minister or whatever. In other words, it has to do with his technical skill to do the specific task. Yes, I use his counsel in the sense he's advising me technically in his field of expertise, but I, don't, I personally don't see Psalm 1 in that light. He's saying, walk not in the counsel of the ungodly in the sense of making my personal decisions or my career decisions or my important decisions without the benefit of godly counselors. And by the way, plural. In many counselors, there is wisdom, the Scripture says. So if you have a key decision in your life, there's several things you want to do. The circumstances themselves are things you want to be sensitive to, obviously. What the Word says is what you want to, you want to be sensitive to. But his, his, his delight, delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Amen. Let me show you. You raised Psalm 1, and I'd like you to look at Joshua chapter 1, 8. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. I want you to notice what it says. It says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Now, that thou mayest observe to do all that according to that is written therein. Let me, uh, before I go any further. Um, we talked last night about the great commandment, that the key issue is to pray that the Holy Spirit allow you to keep the great commandment. That's the only way you'll do it. And if you get him to do that, he has to answer it, because you're playing, you know it's the will of God for you to keep the first commandment. The only way you can is for the Holy, to invoke the authority of the Holy Spirit. So one of my favorite prayers just to bring you all up to speed what I was saying, is that ask in the authority of Jesus Christ, ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit to help you keep the first commandment. That's the only way you will. And if you've done that, the rest will take care of itself because all he's really looking for is fellowship. The rest he can handle. I mean, that's, that, that involves your sovereignty and that's the only part he leaves to you is his willingness not to violate your sovereignty. But notice what it says now. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That not, not, not for intellectual exercise. Why? 
that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Fine. Notice what the rest of it says. For then I will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out lots of blessings. No, that's not what it says. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. You know, we have a, a, a rain shower theory of, of, of uh, Christian leading. You have to read the word and pray, and I just wait. It's going to all rain dollars on me. That's not what it says. It says, Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. The, in, the, the assumption that's implicit in the verse is that you're moving. That you're moving. We agree. The one, the one difficult, it's a practical, real issue, is that if you start getting into some very complex transactions with the guy with whom you are going to mutually share a fiduciary relationship. In business, we have some terms. The concept of an arm's length relationship, which is a lawyer's phrase for, hey, it's arm's length, it's written, it's formal, it's constrained. In contrast to, that's, that's in, in a sense an adversary situation. In, there's actually three situations. There's an adversary situation where you're mutually at contest. There's an arm's length relationship where you mutually agree, agree but to some very circumscribed, specific, denotated issues. Arm's length relationship. And there's a fiduciary relationship w w in which you and he, say, share the obligation to look out for each other's interest. A director of a publicly owned corporation is the fiduciary of the collective shareholders not the shareholders who happen to elect him. If I happen to own a third of a corporation, and I sit at a board meeting, it's a publicly owned corporation, as a director, I don't vote my 30 cents, my 30 percent shares at the board meeting. I vote 100 percent in the sense that I look for the... I'm obligated under the laws of the land to relate to, to all their interests. I may vote as a shareholder, in a shareholder's meeting, my 30 percent. But as elected director, I have, I'm a fiduciary, a hired gun, for all the shareholders. There's a concept of a fiduciary relationship. And the thrust of the question that's at issue is can we enter into an enduring fiduciary relationship with an unsafe person? My belief is I think so. I would enter into those things cautiously because they tend... And incidentally, if I was... I enter into that relationship when I join a board of directors. Tomorrow at the California Club in Los Angeles, I'm going to be meeting with some people to explore... The possibility of their joining another public on the board of Datum, I'm on the board of Western Digital, and a few others. And when I join a board, when I, they asked me to join the board of Datum some year ago, and when I considered that, one of the things I looked at is who am I joining with? Dan McGurk, in, in, he's a, 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 in, a figurehead in this industry, he's the founder of the Computer Industry Association. Tom O'Rourke, chairman of the board of Timeshare, one of the largest network companies in the world. I looked at the quality and the character of the men that I'll be joining. Now, are they saved? I don't know. But are they competent, ethical men with track records of substance? You bet. Or I wouldn't have joined because the exposure is too great. Okay? So there is an issue here that's fuzzy, and I can't give you a simple answer. Can you be yoked with an unbeliever? I am yoked to some limited purpose with unbelievers. It's possible that that may not be in the Lord's will. I'm not sensitive to it. I should pray about that. I personally don't think so. I think that's part of the tribal community in which I traffic and in which my witness, be it good or bad, is manifest. And uh, now, when it gets to a more enduring, longer-term relationship, the longer-term the relationship and the more intimate the bond, the more I'm concerned about the spiritual condition of my partner. I think that's the thrust of the passage. And what Paul is admonishing is don't be yoked adversely with an unbeliever. Now, most of the yoking I'm in, I can unyoke. I can resign from a board easily. Okay, I can disengage the relationships I'm into. As any good attorney will tell you, it's in any contract, it's, you should spend 90% of the language dealing with the divorce, not the marriage. Of a business deal, how are you going to unwind it if things go sour? That's the important part. If things are going well, you don't need the language. What you need is the graceful way to part will keep people together. If it's all pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, I will mention one thing since I've got to let you go. There's one other thing that I do want to leave you with as a businessman. And it's something that and I'll say that you think I'm kidding, but I'm really not. You know, there's an old cliche in business. You know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And boy, that's true in our calling. You can know all the scripture verses, you can have all 
You can have mastered Dennis's notes thoroughly. You can be prompt on all your payments to the bank. You can do all those things, and it doesn't mean a thing. You can make $10 million next year because you played the option market or commodities cleverly or whatever. That doesn't mean a thing. The fact that you're Christian, by the way, doesn't mean that you can't necessarily be worth $10 million a year from now. I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive. They've got nothing to do with one another exactly. Where your heart is what's count, and who's the Lord of your life. That's what counts. And I really believe that Christ died for Ferrari owners too. Okay? <laughs> God bless you.